welcome to the National Arts Club. I'm Katherine Kleszczewski, and thank you so much for joining us. For those of you who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we are a 501c3 nonprofit with the mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts, and to educate the American people in the fine arts. Annually, the club offers more than 150 free programs to the public, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures, and readings. For more information about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at on nationalartsclub.org or find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Today, we will be taking a virtual tour of the flapper look and other 1920s clothing at the Illinois State Museum's textile storage vault. Giving us this sneak peek of these historic garments is curator extraordinaire, Erica Holtz. Let me tell you a little bit about her. Erica Holtz is the curator of history at the Illinois State Museum. Her current exhibition, Growing Up X, explores the toys, technology, and cultural touchstones that shaped Generation X. Holtz has worked in the public history field for more than 20 years, during which time she has curated more than a dozen exhibitions. She is passionate about telling the story of people and the history through material culture. She holds an MA from the Winter Thur Program in Early American Culture. Please give a warm welcome to the amazing Erica Holtz. Hi, Erica. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Um, and I wanna go ahead and give an introduction to uh, Christine Majram, who's here with me today. And I wanna give the caveat um, to your beautiful introduction that sometimes being a curator of a very large collection means that your knowledge is about a mile wide and an inch deep. So I wanna just put the, you know, caveat out there right away that I by no means consider myself an expert in 1920s clothing. We have several amazing examples in this collection and I've, you know, done some reading about it. My weakness too is that I am not a seamstress. I don't know how to sew. Christine is both uh, well learned in historic costume and she's someone who can sew herself. So bringing Christine in really helps to fill in um, historical gaps in my knowledge and also construction gaps. And so between the two of us, we're just going to kind of have a casual fun time. If you're a textile or historic clothing nerd, we hope this will be like Christmas morning to you, um, going through some of the boxes in our collection and explore the clothing of the 1920s. Um, so with that, I want to start by showing this image of a flapper. Has anyone been to a 1920s party recently and gone on amazon.com and ordered themselves an outfit like this? Um, this is sort of the like kind of, you know, popular commercial idea of what a flapper looks like. And there's some things that, you know, we can point to in the 1920s. And then there's some like, you know, myths and things that have kind of gotten um, updated for a 21st century sensibility along the way. So um, Christine, what jumps out at you is like maybe less accurate. Um, well, the first thing is definitely the length of the skirt. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, I mean, maybe you could get away with that if you were a cabaret dancer um, in the 19th 1920s, but definitely not just like going to a party or like walking down the street. Um, it was very, very rare to show any knee at all. Um, by and large, the shortest the skirts got in the 20s was about 1926 when they reached the bottom of the kneecap. Um, other things, those shoes most definitely not. <laughs> oh my goodness, again. Um, the shoes in the 20s were pretty low heeled. I mean, you really like a high heel was like two inches. Um, and the uh, the toes were rather pointy rather than um, that kind of rounded toe there. Um, also, it's really low cut at the top, too. That's kind of and very body conscious, like we're very yes. body con in the 21st century. Yeah. There was freedom and movement of the 1920s dresses, but it was a freedom of like a boxy rectangular silhouette, not yes. like a like hook <laughs> my midsection silhouette. Um, yeah, everything draped from the shoulders. So like whatever your your shoulder width was, that was the width your dress was supposed to look like all the way down. So yeah, definitely no like curve hugging things. Um, the fringe too, you know, I think we were both a little surprised going through 
the collection to pull things for this the other day but there was maybe what was it one dress that we saw that had there was one on dress it? with fringe and i did a little reading and yeah. it turns out that in the 1920s um this was before synthetic fringe so the fringe that was available was like a you know a like a silk woven twisted it would have been probably more in line with like upholstery fringe today if you can picture the like heavy stuff that hangs off of sofas and so that was used very sparingly it's more common to see um elaborate beadwork and sequins yeah. on gowns um in the 1950s there was a big fascination with the jazz age in hollywood and so the thing that kind of gave rise to this is this idea of 20s through the lens of the 50s where they were more body conscious you know marilyn monroe wanted to show off her waist and her you know decolletage and this was an era of synthetic fringe so it was much cheaper to buy fringe and you know rack it on a costume than to hand embroider or bead a dress for costume purposes so yeah. this is kind of where we get this idea of flappers is like covered in fringe yeah okay so let's bust some myths with yeah. the actual garments yes. of the 20s and one myth we want to start out busting is by showing this garment right here and uh, Gabby, our wonderful um, camera person, is probably going to keep most of the focus on the clothes, um, not on us. So, um, you know, prepare to look at some clothes. So this gown um, is a nice kind of short sleeved, um, short gown. And we threw this in here as sort of a like surprise because this is not even from the 1920s. This is from around probably 1916, I would say. And so the first myth that we're going to bust is that hemlines shot up dramatically in 1920 for the first time in human history. Um, <laughs> in actuality, they've been kind of rising and falling through the 19 teens, like an ankle wouldn't have shocked anyone in the, you know, teens era. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I, I, I just, a thought occurred to me too with this is the these dresses because the hemline was rising and falling so much in the teens um i mean you could take a dress like this and put a skirt underneath it if the hemline suddenly fell oh, one sure. year because uh that was also a fashion in the teens was to have like these multi layers of skirts um so yeah i mean a lot of the dresses we're looking at today like this this isn't haute couture um, this is somebody, you know, here in Illinois, probably like making their own or having their dressmaker make their own. So or ordering it from Sears or ordering it from Sears. Yeah, they, it's just the rise of this mass, you know, manufacturing of clothing in the, the early 20th century, too. So um, some of the pieces that we look at are going to be a little bit mishmashed and they don't always fit into these nice little boxes of uh you know what Chanel was doing in Paris right, in 1922 right. so um yeah it's it's just very interesting to look at how real everyday people were interpreting these trends and working them into their daily lives and and so, so Christine and, and Erica I have a question for you so um what would that occasion be for for that, that particular dress like if you were to wear that dress where would they be right here? yeah mm -hmm. um that looks like an afternoon dress to me. I just like, um, yeah, something, you know, if you were receiving callers or pay, maybe if you're paying calls with a coat on top of it, um, definitely not evening wear. Um, but nicer than like a house dress. You're yeah. not like in the house in it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, this the lace is really fine and it's metallic um, and it's kind of on all the, the edges, you know, the hemline. And then there's this nice kind of beaded, panel here I don't know if you can get oh, that oh is it beautiful yeah isn't that lovely these little is, seed is, is there a tag or is, do we know who made that dress do we have a problem this one is not um have a tag and we actually um comparatively few dresses here are from dressmakers or at least their tag survives we're guessing most of the ones that we'll be looking at are um probably either handmade or um potentially mass produced yeah yeah so, um, so the 19 teens is a time of it's sort of the last gasp of a lot of like Victorian sensibilities. Um, it's you've got World War One going on that kind of disrupts things. So we're going to move into the 1920s, and there was sort of a, a 
like a watershed moment in culture where, you know, we've survived the war, we've survived the pandemic, yeah. if, if you have, yeah. um, and having just come through that, you know, you know, there's this impetus to like, let's get out and live because we did survive, yeah, you know, so um, great. and oh, so uh, with new technologies like radio and movies and automobile and the sort of youth culture that's bubbling up. Yeah, the rise of the, the jazz age and, you know, dance halls and stuff like that being socially acceptable for the first time for a woman to go you know out into a dance hall and, and economic and, prosperity yes and um, consumerism yes and so all of that you're going to see reflected in the clothes so um oh, before you before you um before we get up, go away from the 1916 uh era um we had a couple of questions so what kind of fabric is that dress made out of and it's silk, ultimately. It's, it's a really fine silk. Um, huh. I'm not sure what I would call that. Noir, then, maybe it's it's very fine. Hmm. And then Jane um, asked, uh, "What fabrics were used most frequently, and how were they laundered?" Oh, that's a tough question. Um, I mean, for everyday folks, um, you know, it was mostly natural fabrics. Still, I. I was reading up a little bit about rayon the other day, like viscose and rayon. And when that was invented, it was actually invented in like the mid 19th century. It just didn't really, the manufacturing process was difficult and it didn't catch on um, until the early 20th century. So you start to see some of those synthetics like working their way in, but um, by and large, a lot of wool for like everyday wear, so, um, well, yeah, I'm silk kind of for cool. afternoon and evening, cotton for, yeah, your, you know, Day dresses, dress, or your yeah. like long dresses. Yes, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Dresses. So it's important to remember in the 19 teens, laundering your clothes meant laundering your undergarments. You would wear like a, a combination or a slip or a chemise, and that's going to absorb the dirt and oils from your body, and that will get a regular washing, just like your underwear today. And your outer garment, like this is not going to be washed or scrubbed. Yeah. You will brush the dust off it, you will spot clean it if yeah. you spill something on on it but this will never be like washed in the way that we understand washing clothes today okay great let's go to the 1920s okay. so, i go. can't wait to see those glad rags <laughs> <laughs> that was a new term to me <laughs> okay there we go oh, wow. so this one was Probably, I mean, we found a lot of kind of stereotypical 20s dresses in this collection, but this, you know, the little black dress of the 1920s was probably, you know, that was an iconic fashion moment. Um, and that's thanks to uh, Coco Chanel, because prior to um, her, you know, development of the little black dress, black is a morning color. Yeah, it's not <laughs> one you wear to like happy parties. Yeah, not really. It was, yeah, I mean, your, your servant's dress was black and it was very like heavy and dowdy. And yeah, if you were in mourning, you wore black and maybe a little white depending on what stage you were in. But yeah, black was not really an evening color until Coco Chanel came along and said, yes, it is. Um, so of course we all wear these today. Everybody has at least one of these in our closet and Eric is very much today. And we're in and a long black dress. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, this, this was kind of a shocker to people, like you said, that had the more Victorian sensibility of all these rules that were suddenly questioned during the war era. And during the twenties, it was kind of like, why are we still doing this? Let's, let's do something new and exciting. Can we can we get a little closer to the detail of, of the dress? By the way, that looks like something that someone could wear today. Oh, actually. totally. Oh, absolutely. It's, um, this one is a little tag, uh, Moffat 1928, which is nice. I should say that uh, the bulk of our textile collection was transferred to us from one of two sources. We absorbed the collection of the University of Illinois textile departments, as well as Illinois State University's textile departments. And the provenance didn't always come true or come with it. Sometimes it's just 1920s dress, but when they are actually labeled and pinpointed to a specific year, it's, it's great. Yeah, that's nice. So yeah, this one you were wanting close-ups and stuff. This is it's actually 
this like slinky mesh fabric. There's like a mesh overlay here. And then this nice kind of low waist. And then another overlay on the skirt, but it's this lovely lace. We're gonna see a lot of really great lace today. This is black and blue. So the blue kind of pops out against the black. And so this is a decade that's all about movement, right? The the skirt would have a wonderful, like flowing, moving capability. Yes. And it's, you know, it's not a woman wearing a corset and a blouse buttoned up with hook and eyes or anything. Like yes. she can get out on the dance floor and like literally kick Do her heels. Yeah, yeah. So oh, um, is that um, when um corsets uh, when when women were starting to ditch the corset around this time? Sort of. I mean, they don't go away altogether. Um, actually, they they the World War II dealt a blow to the corsets because the steel boning in the corsets had to be conserved for the war effort. Yeah. So, but yeah, those lastex corsets that kind of replaced that were starting to come in in the twenties, though, weren't they? Where it was like you know, again with these new synthetic fabrics, and people wanted to do stuff with them, and suddenly, well, we don't need a defined waist. We don't need whalebone and steel to support the bosom anymore. We need, we want to look like Irene Castle. We want to look flat and boyish and right, very right. straight. So, and if you can do that with an elastic fabric that's more comfortable, why would you not? So, um, yeah, this is definitely, I think I also read that the first patent for a bra design was in 1921 or 22. It was, and the, the bras were like a more of a bandeau, like yeah. to sort of squish the bosom, not like, you know, lift and separate. Yeah, that, you know. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's it represents kind of the start of the change where we're gonna start to see less and less of the corset used as shaping. And, you know, I mean, corsetry is still used in couture today just to, you know, smooth lines out. Um, so it didn't ever completely go away, but it's uh, definitely not what it used to be. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, and then is that a drop? Is that a drop waist? And and we and one of our viewers, um, she's asking, where did the the drop waist start? Uh, that that's Catherine's question. Catherine with a K. When did the drop waist start? Um. So the drop waist really did kind of start I think kind of right at 1920 um, and it just kind of gradually moved down as the decade went along um, yeah I mean if I if I see a dress that's you know looks like the skirt is shorter but the um, the bodice is also short it's kind of like well I think maybe that that's from the late teens actually mm -hmm. um, if it's at kind of the natural waist uh, it's teens and then it just kind of I think it kind of went with the skirt. Like I said, the hemline got but really like short. inverse. Like exactly. It just dropped kind of, and the hem went up. Yeah, the skirt just kind of did this <laughs> as the decade went on. So um, yeah, about like 1926, you get a hem a hemline that's like just below the knee, and you get a waistline that's like at right the hip. hip. Yeah. yeah. So uh yeah, that was a good question. Awesome. All right, let's go on to the next. Well, we've got a lot to see. We do. I know there's a lot to see. So, uh, great. Okay. And this one we wanted to show, um, this is early 1920s. And again, um, the hemline is still kind of creeping up, but it's probably like mid calf at this point. Um, there's the idea of like 1920s is the flapper era. So everyone's wearing, you know, a beaded dress all the time. Yeah. And like, you know, there's like people are going to work or, yeah. you know, they have jobs or whatever. There's older people who are more conservative. So this is sort of one of like a sort of somber 19 teens, World War One yes. era color that's still kind of hanging on into the 1920s. Um, you've got this wonderful like side gather detail here. It's kind of like this asymmetrical neckline that gathers right here with a flower. And that's kind of like a late teens, early 20s convention. Um, I love this. It's got this kind of like suit coat motif, which um, you saw a lot of like menswear inspired clothes for women in the 1920s. 
yeah, that was that became kind of a big deal, especially with the rise of like sportswear and stuff where women started borrowing. Um, and of course the silhouette was so boxy, it was like, well, the men already know how to do this. Let's let's just copy them. So um yeah, this this is a really good example of early 20s where it's we're starting to, I, I think I said to Erica, it's like, yeah, it's this kind of somber color, but there's a little glitz here. It's like, can we party yet? You know, <laughs> the war's over, like, let's get to it. You know, you and actually, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, the um, interject, the, um, that collar actually looks similar to, let's say, a smoking jacket. So I right. guess working first, did, was it the smoking jacket or was it, did, did the smoking jacket derive from, let's say, women's clothing? For example, I think oh, the smoking jacket came first. The smoking yeah. jacket. I mean, the smoking jacket evolved from you know Oriental robes that people brought back from Japan and China in like the 18th century. So okay. well, that's a pretty old form. Um, but yeah, it's been done in so many iterations for both men and women since then. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Moving on. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And then um, I guess while you're doing that, um, what were the undergarments? Were they bras or you said there was a bandeau that people would use? Yes. In the 1920s, yeah, you, this is when you start to see a bra and then there were, I don't know what the proper word, it's not quite a corset, it's not quite a quite a girdle, but it like grabs you probably from like under the bust to the hips. And yeah. it's ideas to kind of like flatten. You're not trying to nip in your waist. Yeah. It's just trying to like, I think it was called a, a girdle actually. And I mean, I have seen too, where they're really just suspenders because you're wearing stockings with these new short skirts. The thing was, um, you know, previously stockings had been just very black or white and they were kind of meant to not really be seen. And in this era, for the first time, we get like flesh toned. We have some stockings. Yeah, they were kind of Let's see a close up of of this of this. Uh, ooh. Well, I'll look at these. We have some nylons. I'll show you the stockings and the flesh tone. Um, this is meant to evoke like suntanned legs because yes. there's this um, emphasis on athleticism and activity and being out playing tennis. And so we've got this also daring little like um, ankle detail here because you might be kicking up your heels doing the Charleston and someone <laughs> might see that. And so, yeah, yeah. these stockings would be um, either if you're being conservative, you would have them clipped to your garter. If not, you would have them roll down to your thigh or maybe even below your knee. Oh, wow. Did they do that themselves or did they or or or, uh, or was that already like pre done for them? The... They did it themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. OK, time to get out that that little bedazzler. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was super popular. It was just like anything to kind of show off the fact that I'm yeah. a new model. Um, so this yeah. is a, like, we looked at this dress and we were like, huh, you know, so um, we wanted to show it off just because some things are a little bit like hard to, you know, hard to define. Yeah, this was, I mean, like Erica said, we were a little puzzled by this because it was like, well, it kind of looks like it has a drop waist a little bit if you compare the length of the skirt to the length of the bodice. And what is even going on with these ties up here? Like, I've never really seen anything yeah, like sure. this before for this era. Um, this one has an average. Oh, yes. Worn by Miss Faye Elliott, Siobhan, oh, Illinois. We said, um, Faye, you might need to, oh, 1920. There yeah, we go. Yeah. We thought Faye might need to edit a little bit. Like, she might have taken it just a smidge too far with her shoulder detail. A little bit. <laughs> But yeah, I I love the fact that the the date on there is a date on this, and it says right at 1920 because I think this was actually a teen's dress that was modified in the 1920s. So if you look at the skirt down here, um, you know there's this huge wide hem. Look how wide that's like a six inch deep hem here, and there's one, two, three layers underneath here and this bottom layer is linen so it would have been starched and the skirt would have stood out quite a bit 
And of course, then there's these side panels that are sheer um, that, that would have kind of emphasized the skirt standing out, which was very popular in the late 19 teens. But I think what happened based on some construction details that we saw up here on the sleeves is I think they shortened all of these skirts by taking the underskirts up and then they cut the bottom off the sheer layer and made sleeves for it. Hmm. Oh, so yeah, <laughs> it's, again, these are fun things when Erica and I like dive into boxes, like we're always looking for, yeah, is this a repurposed dress? Like, are there repairs on it? Is there somebody's name written in at a laundry mark? You know, I know you get really excited about laundry Too, marks yeah. and stuff. So. Because oh. they both wanted a real women and yes. real women didn't just order like a couture gown that yes. they wore once and put away. You know, you yeah. take your old clothes and you repurpose it and you make it work and you jazz it up for a new era. And yeah. yeah. So that yeah. was that was going on a lot. I mean, pretty well into the 20th century and yeah. A really great example of it right there. Oh, so here's a question. Um, Zoe has a question. Um, is that the front or the back of the dress? Uh, you know, that's a good question. I think we kind of debated about that. I think it's the back. I think so too, mm -hmm. because the way the buttons and yeah are you know, mixed with the snaps there. Yeah, it's I I mean sometimes you don't don't get if there was like a belt over the the waist to kind of cover that stuff up that doesn't survive always so it's a little difficult to say but yeah I, I would tend to agree with Erica that this this looks like the back of a dress yeah. excellent question yeah, very good Eagle eyes, whoever yeah. found that out yeah. yeah also I wanted to ask you a question about when you're handling the gar the garments are do you normally wear gloves or or is it first really like things that are like colonial or you know, something like that. Split by that, and um, people You're making have special opinions yeah. about it. Um, so, and it varies institution by institution. Um, some institutions have in their policies wash your hands. Others recommend the use of white cotton gloves. Um, I have washed my hands um, to keep them clean and rub the oil off them. Reason being, a lot of these fabrics are incredibly delicate. And as we get into more of like the party dresses, some of them have like very elaborate beadwork sequins. And I just don't want anything that will catch and damage the dress. And so with those white gloves on, I'm going to lose dexterity and increase the possibility that a loose thread or something will catch. So I really want to keep my hands free and clean. Okay. All right. And we're washing our hands all the time anyway. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We learned that in the pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure those folks also during that time were also washing their hands all the time as well. They got a crash course after their pandemic. Yeah. They definitely stopped, you know, chewing tobacco and spitting in the street and <laughs> drinking out of a common dipper. So yeah. they made some hygiene adjustments too. Yeah. All right. And then that's a yellow, I'm assuming. A yellow that, okay, we're moving on. So yeah. yeah. That's a yellow or a beige or? It's like, yeah, like a yellow kind of buff color there. Yeah. Okay. Just a lemony yellow. Very good. All right. Moving right along. Yeah, so this is a lady that's getting some business done. Um, yeah, in the 1920s post-war, there, there were a lot of women that um, you know found themselves in the workforce for the first time during the war as the men were overseas. And um, this is a little more glamorous example maybe of that it, it looks kind of like an afternoon dress but it also kind of looks like you know somebody's going to the bank or to like conduct some business or something right um and what I really love about this is uh not only uh, I think Erica pointed out these really nice kind of um vertical belt details here that just look very 19 teens but then you also have this very kind of Egyptian looking motif in the embroidery on it, which of course is very early 20s, of course, 1922, uh, Howard Carter uh, finds Tutankhamun. Mm -hmm. And so everybody went Egyptian crazy. Um, and this is a really great example of that. It's in excellent condition. Um, Average, and it's, it's wool. It's got the, you know, absolutely straight silhouette, absolutely. like shoulder to hem, straight up and down. Like this is a style conscious woman who's got a really, you know, nice quality snappy yeah. outfit. Yeah. And and she's working it. Um yeah, this is like you said, it's it's obviously 
just somebody that knew what was going on and knew what they wanted to project in the world. And was confident enough to do it. Yeah. Um, one thing there was um, sort of a, a generational difference. Like this is kind of an era that, you know, there were a lot of women who came up in the Victorian era were used to corsets and long skirts and high lace up boots. And that's what they were gonna wear. Yeah. And that was fine. You know, it was it was a generational thing. Like, yeah. sure, you Absolutely. know, I'm my teenage self. I'm going to wear one thing to a party and grandma, you can wear another thing to your bridge club. Well, yeah, it's I mean, it's like, you know, 10 years ago or however long it's been now since it, you know, waist trainers became a thing when Kim Kardashian right. became popular. And then, you know, all the middle aged and older folks were like, oh, you know, we have to do that. <laughs> like, no, no. I mean, it's yeah. Leave it's, it to the kids. Leave it to the kids. And yeah, you're right. It was very much the same here, where um, um, there was there was a huge shift, and some people kept up, and some people didn't necessarily. Yeah. So this woman's mother might have been wearing a floral length skirt and a blouse. Yeah. And she is wearing this. Yep. And then let's look at what her potentially her domestic servant is wearing <laughs> underneath. And then what was the purpose of the plackets? The plackets? Do you mean the belts, the vertical belts? I guess that's what they meant. I guess okay. it's probably There's the design. It's it's not, it doesn't serve a function. It's just okay. Right. Fair enough. Good. Okay then. And so this dress we like because this is like I know a boring dress and we dug that because again in the 1920s you think like flapper jazz age like wild fashion <laughs> conventions and this is like this is a woman who might be you know it, like maybe she's the Downton Abbey servant on their day off or she works as a shop girl or at a bank or yeah, something yeah. like um this is a kind of just conservative probably yeah it's it kind of just says I, I'll tell you what made me say uh domestic servant is the cuffs here because there's this little band on the cuff that doesn't match the rest of the dress and it, it seems it's really like loosely hand stitched on and it really seems to be just there to protect the edge of the cuff like as if you were doing work while you were um wearing this dress it is, it does feel like silk though. I mean, me. could it be rayon so, though? It could have been rayon, absolutely. We'd have to do a burn test to figure that out. And I don't think we're allowed to do that here, but um, yeah. Actually, um, there was a domestic silk industry that started in Illinois or the United States in the 1870s. I oh, remember really? this from my um, my previous exhibit on fashioning Illinois and fashion of the 19th century. And one of the, you know, kind of, comments that was made is like silk is so cheap that even your servant girl can have a silk dress for Sunday now. Oh, that's great. So, I didn't know that. It's very interesting. Okay. And of so, course, you know, upper class women never liked it when their domestic servants tried yeah. to dress above their station. Of so. course, of course. But here you don't look like you're dressing above the station. It's just um yeah, it's a very kind of basic dress, but not at all what we think of the 1920s with as somber as it is. And it's a good reminder about just how many women were in the workforce. Yeah. Um, I think 25% of the workforce in America was women at that time. Yeah. And the 20s saw expanding opportunities with, you know, the expansion of department stores, with office culture. You yeah, said, you know, she wore this to the steno pool, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Um, yeah, when were uh, synthetic uh, fabrics created? Was that around this time as well, would you say? So um, yeah, I, I read somewhere that the the viscose process was invented. It was kind of in, in, independently invented by two different people in the mid nineteenth century. Um, the the process was really toxic, <laughs> as most things in the nineteenth century were, and um, so it didn't really catch on until the early twentieth century. There was a, somebody updated the process to make it a little safer. Um, so yeah, you're starting to see viscose and rayon in like the 19 teens and twenties kind of working its way in. So yeah, it is entirely possible that this is viscose or rayon. And rayon um, held dye really well. So what yes. you do see in this era is like a lot of fabrics with these like fun, bright colors yes. that, you know, are grabbing on the back. Yeah. Okay. 
I would wear that dress. I would too. I don't know. That's so many garments. Oh, I'm going to have to go. Oh, right. Yeah, we have accessories. Oh. And this one we like too, because this is a night, I guess we, we were like drawn to the like more conservative dresses in contrast to the flapper. Like this is a nice kind of conservative afternoon dress. Yeah, yeah. But look at this lace. Oh my goodness. Ooh. Like this is so Can you give us a real close up? Or is that close uh -huh. you can get? Yeah. That is exquisite. Isn't that lovely? That is lovely. Was that hand done or or did yeah. they just buy it and then they would this looks there? hand done to me? Yeah. And it was probably probably an heirloom. Um, you know, lace is it's like, I mean, except for hook couture, it's all like uh machine made now. So we don't think of lace as a super valuable thing. But in the early 20th century, like you know, the Vanderbilt family had their laces kept in their safe. You know, it, it was a big deal if you had fine lace. And uh, so it would have been reused and passed down through the generations uh, and, you know, recut and folded and, and um, just used until it fell apart because it was so valuable. Um, this is, I'm sure, hundreds of hours of handwork just to do this little bit. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. So we're now you're showing us a lot of dresses that are actually like for like a maybe an average size woman maybe a little thinner um was that the normal size at that time for women at during that time or oh, I don't know much about yeah um, yeah it was I think between the 1950s and the 1990s the average woman's waistline expanded by 10 inches so um a processed food diet and refined sugars have um kind of made their mark on American society so yeah there there definitely were you know like fuller figured women um yeah, yeah. but and I the average woman was smaller than today's average woman um that said a lot of times the dresses that are preserved tend to be um you know like they're they're somebody's nice dress and um they so they don't it can't fit someone else or like you know it's your wedding dress that you wore on your wedding day yeah. when you were like before you had six kids and everything <laughs> yeah. so usually like the smaller ones are the ones that survive in museum collections yeah that's very true yeah and then what is the lace made out of do you know offhand oh uh I would imagine silk yeah it feels like silk to me lovely all right, well, Lovely. we are at almost 22 the hour. So um, how many yeah, do we have? have? The last, we're gonna blitz you with eye candy for the last oh, five excellent. minutes. We can wind up with some more discussion, but yeah, we had, um, we've got another box of just pretty dresses. <laughs> okay. All right. I can't wait to see those glad rags. <laughs> I'm plugging my 1920s slang. Put that to the side and we'll move the other box over. We knew we had too many dresses. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh do, do, you, do you ever have people wear those wear these dresses? Like ever? Like I know that there was always there was a big hoopla with um Kim Kardashian wearing the Marilyn Monroe um. Uh, yeah. dress do you ever like do that do you ever let if, if kim calls you up says i want to wear that dress would you let her it would have to be a seven figure like donation <laughs> to our <laughs> well, it would depend on the dress it's, it's not ethical to let people like wear museum yeah. clothes but you know yeah but it's so tempting you know you so know tempting. Tempting. So this one is so fun. This is um, gold lame over like a like a still pale sagey silk liner, and just and it also comes with in this area here. You can see it's got like a cape and a what did we think this was? Like I think turban? it's a turban. I think it's like a 
matching turban that you would um, wrap around your head with your short cropped hair. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you wear this, this nice asymmetrical hem, very modern looking dress with your evening cape. Um, and yeah, very much like glitzy evening wear, like going to the theater. Or something. Yeah, and like metallic meant money, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. This was it's it's party time with this one. So, yeah, that one was fun. Is that a is that a metallic um fabric? Oh, or... but... oh my god. Oh, geez, look at this. Okay, we didn't flip the case. Oh, over. Oh, yeah, let's take a close look. Huh? Ooh. So, yeah, it's, oh my gosh, this is like an inset bit of net that's been embroidered and beaded. This is insane. Oh my gosh. What, what is that? <laughs> it's, well, it's, it's kind of an abstract floral pattern. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's a leaf here and kind of a bigger leaf here. I'm not sure what this is meant to be. Sometimes, I mean, this is, you know, in the 1920s, you're seeing the rise of like modernist painting and stuff too. So you get a lot more abstraction with a lot of these motifs where it's not meant to represent anything in particular. It's just pretty. It's just pretty. <laughs> so that was a nice surprise. I'm going to end there. I'm going to go back to our system that I messed up. Oh, okay. Oh my goodness. There we go. Oh yeah, I see you have shoes there too to go with the yes. dresses. Yes. And and what about hats? Did, wasn't it common to actually wear feathers in the hat and that kind of thing? And you know, the the feather, I mean, it's always been popular to um embellish hats. Um in the early 20s, I would say definitely yes, because the brims were still pretty wide mm -hmm. um, and they were very kind of like downturned. Um, so there was, the crown was larger and you had this kind of downturned brim. So there was plenty of space to play with decoration. Towards the end of the 20s, the brim just kind of collapses and you get what we think of as the classic cloche hat. Um, that completely covers the whole head, including the forehead. And you have to kind of hold your nose up like this in order to see properly. <laughs> um, and that you could only wear these, here we go. You could only wear these if you had bobbed hair, if you had, you know, long hair like I do and have a nice chignon in the back. Um, you can't wear this. It's going to like make it so you can't see. So yeah, this is from the late 20s, again, with the gold and the beading. And it's black, but not morning wear, clearly, <laughs> you know. Um, um, so I can wear that because I have a bobbed cut. So you could, yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. You you could could. Totally it's not too it. long, right? It's it, it'd be like around this length. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, even shorter at times, there's something called the Eaton crop that mm -hmm. was really popular in starting in the early 20s, but it became more fashionable. It's a boy cut. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's completely just layered and the longest is like four inches on top, but it might be only an inch down at the nape. So yeah, um, yeah, hats were, were doing a big thing as well in the 20s. And so this one is like a complete showstopper and you know. This is a flapper dress. Mm -hmm. This is a flapper dress, <laughs> yeah. Whoa. And yeah, that's like sequins and beads and. Yeah, gold lame on the sides here. This gold lame, I wish you guys could touch this. It's so heavy and stiff and it like feels cold to touch it. <laughs> it's, um, they don't make lame like this anymore. It's just crazy. And it's got a little bit of a scalloped hem. Oh, it does. Yeah. 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 That's the so, top of the dress? Where where would you? Bottom. Um, the top is up here and- Oh, okay. <laughs> I was about to say. So yeah, this is yeah, like um like Christine said, this is a true flapper dress. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this one is a, is a kind of early example though, too. I think I just saw the tag said 1921. Right. So I mean you can see it's pretty long still. It's not that knee length short, but we still do have like a scalloped hem. There's not really a defined waist on this at all. There's no seam there that I can tell from here. Um, is that a 
like an under yeah a little bit of a yeah oh okay it's there. well there's yeah this inset does kind of start at I don't can't tell if that's meant to be the waist or the hip but um yeah you're right there's a waist tape in there stabilizing it so yeah we were getting glitzy early on here that is very glitzy did, did a lot of uh did did I guess my I have two questions one is did did every woman have a dress like this? Was this a common thing to have? I, I mean, unless you go out on the nightlife, right? It, it was it, or is it was it for specific type of people who would wear the this dress? You know, that's going to vary widely depending on where you are in the country. Yeah. I, so. And I mean, yeah, if you're in a big city, if you're in a small town, if you're on the East Coast, if you're on the West Coast, if you're you know, here in the, the middle America, um, yeah, there's there's going to be a lot of communities that are more conservative where you're really not going to see a lot of this. Mm -hmm. And there's also going to be just individuals that were interested in fashion and were interested in driving to the next town over to go sample the nightlife. Um, it's and it's difficult to generalize about it is like and I remember one of these I looked up we had a name associated a very you know ornate beaded sequin dress and I thought it would be a flapper you know yeah. a, a teenager and it was a woman in her 50s and it's like okay you know like she's going out and partying yeah. in like a beaded dress yeah. so. that's interesting that's so cool yeah you just want to know let's, um, let's move on to the last question all right Those are really big boxes. And so, oh yeah, this was one of our like wow dresses. Yeah. You want to do that? Yeah, very Okay. Now we're getting some color. Yeah, so it's very like a delicate, flowy silk crayon. One of those. <laughs> I can't really tell by touching it. Um, Got these neat like panel kind of things for vertical elements. Yeah, very, very drapey, very straight cut. I'm just gonna fix that there. Um, and then these beads are so wonderful. They look like shell. I don't, I don't know if they are natural shell or if they're synthetic glass, but um, it just gives a very kind of natural look with the turquoise color. I mean, you could wear this today. You absolutely could. I would wear this. Today. I would absolutely wear this. But um, all hand like sewn on, yeah, right? Yeah, so everything's just... been hand stitched on this one, and it's just, oh yeah, so so lovely um it's got these nice little this is the bit of fringe that we found <laughs> the, the one bit of 20s fringe is this little bit of beading at the end of the the waist belt that's a, and then where would that be that would be the belt for the for the dress yeah, um i mean it's it or would yeah, you wear it around there there's another one though i think it the dangle off the end of the dress that's, or is well it that's what around? I was just wondering is like I don't know if you would because this dress is so short you could actually just let this dangle um or, yeah there's oh, yeah okay um but yeah you could also kind of girdle it and tie it kind of down low in the front and make it make it into a belt if you want um it's was there a date on this one? Do you remember? I was gonna say if if you they are kind of defining the waist a little bit more, it might suggest that it's getting more into the later 20s, because right around 1930, you'd start to see the waist getting a little bit more defined again. No, okay. Oh, just guess. Guess. <laughs> okay, and underneath that, we have another. All right. And what oh, were they? Oh, okay. It, were those um, beads were they white or silver? The on the on the blue dress. I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Were they white or silver? Were no. they white or silver? The, the beads? beads. Oh, they're neither. Um, they're kind of they look like natural shell. You know, okay. they just kind of translucent look to them. They're very 
it's a it's pale but there's a purple tone in there that's like yeah. there's a reddish violet tone in there there's a blue tone in there um it they just kind of move with the light mm. and we love this one too uh, this one's one of my favorites <laughs> oh gorgeous so lovely yeah. got the flower you see these a lot on waists or shoulders Mm -hmm. um, and then this color is just so ah, I know. delicious. Uh, pink yeah. and really is that, like is that uh, silk by any chance? This feels this like silk. Definitely to me. silk. Yeah. yeah, I don't think that's a synthetic. Um yeah, it's a it's a sharp mousse uh weave, so you can kind of feel it a little bit more than the crepes. Um yeah, this skirt is is nice because this overlay here um you know it's attached at the bottom and then it's got this lace underneath it i can just imagine somebody switching this on the dance floor and the the gold just catching the light and looking absolutely stunning okay so yeah there's like in 1923 to 25. okay so yeah there's like an underskirt there yeah yeah yeah, I'd buy that, most definitely. Yeah, that's fun. That is a lot so, of work. Um, oh, and we did want to show some shoes as oh, well. Yes. In contrast to the idea that, um, you know, oh. there's spike heels in the <laughs> flapper era. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my word. Lovely. So, yeah, these are... These are, you know, late teens or early 20s. Um, and you can see, you know, the toe is pretty pointy, um, and the heels are really quite low. They're, I mean, this was a high heel. This, this one here is probably a little earlier than this one here. I would, I would say this one's maybe right at 1920. This one, um, mid -20s, I don't, mid twenties, mid maybe up to like 26 or so. Um, in the late twenties, you start to get. <clears throat> um, a heel that's more like what I'm wearing that's a uh, Cuban heel. See how like straight it is. There's not really much wasting to it, um, but this is still a pretty strongly wasted heel. Um, and then of course you have all of these interesting elements like the, the straps and the buttons because you're showing off the fact that um, your ankles are showing and you want to see yeah, them. people are so, going to see your shoes and you yeah. get that kind of the interesting cutout yeah. details and yeah. you're showing you know skin or stocking as the case may be here yes. they look like uh, dancing shoes actually yes um they're very similar I um yeah I did some ballroom dancing when I was younger and I was really shocked at how uh, like all of the ballroom shoes that you buy for like Latin dance and like waltzes and stuff, even they look like 1920s, 1930s shoes. Yeah. Um, and it's, they're so comfortable to wear, um, you know, modern heels, uh, the heel balance is usually so far off because it's towards the back here, but these, and you can really see this on this other pair, the heel is set further forward. So your center of gravity is actually more centered on the shoe. Huh. Um, and it's much easier to dance it, I think. Ergonomics of shoes. Yeah, they, they were doing, you know. Yeah, so. Um, and we must be pretty close to. Very close to the, to the top of the hour. So um, let me ask you a few more questions. Um, so um, by the way, that this presentation is fabulous it and I may may I add it it was the cat's pajamas like you really know your onions <laughs> so that and, and if anyone knows doesn't know that it's it's I am saying 1920s jargon uh the cat's pajamas meaning you know excellent excellent presentation and then you know your onions that means you know your stuff so <laughs> um but anyway, so I have a couple of other key questions. And one is, um, I noticed that there weren't any pants uh, displayed. Do, do you have pa women's pants in your collection? And because, you know, women were starting to wear pants or in the 20s. Um, that's a great question. I don't, and I haven't 
been through all the boxes here. I don't know that we do. Pants were kind of starting to come in for women in the 20s. They got a little bit more popular in the 30s. Um, but another thing is we fall into the trap of museum collections where people tend to save the best and the prettiest, you know, and so pants were less interesting than, you know, my hot pink party dress, you know, so a, a museum collection is a little bit self-selected and not representative in that way, because what comes to us is what people loved or, you know, thought was special or beautiful enough to save. And yeah, so it's not it's maybe one pair of pants for every 50, you know, oh, pretty yeah. dresses. Yeah. And so dresses more and more common to, to wear, wearing during this time. And uh, yeah. For women, yeah, um, kind of a big innovation was like sweaters, you know, like a sweater and skirt separate and the sportswear look. So that was like a big move towards casual, casual yeah, stay the, wear. The sportswear, yeah, we, we've always loved our, our sportswear and our loungewear in America in particular, <laughs> you know, with Claire McCardle coming in later and, and really taking that and running with it. Um, but yeah, pants in the 20s for women. Um, Again, still, it was not socially acceptable. It was not a thing that you really wore out in public. Uh, as late as the late 1930s, there was a woman arrested for contempt of court in LA for wearing pants to a hearing that she attended. And the judge said, you will not wear that in my courtroom and go home and change. And she wouldn't. So he held her in contempt of court. Um, so this this wasn't you know it was acceptable as like loungewear at home it was pajamas um mm -hmm. and kind of in the 20s you start to see the rise of the beach pajamas which i know people just went insane about around the globe a couple of years ago where all these 20s and 30s beach pajamas were becoming popular again um i so, missed that trend i need to google uh, that <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah, it, it really was not much of a thing. And like Erica said, because it was such a kind of casual, like it's like your sweatpants <laughs> today, like you're probably not gonna save it. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> so um, I guess another question, this would be, um, who were the key fashion designers of the 1920s you say? You mentioned Chanel, that's an obvious one. Um, any others? that maybe come across your mind? There was um, Jean Lanvin out of um, Paris and she, did I mispronounce it? <laughs> yeah. um, and sure thing was like the, the hip thing. Like yes. she liked the floof on the sides and yeah. like the gathered kind of fluffy, more feminine. Yeah, that, that was cool. a big deal. Um, I mean, Paul Poiret was still around uh, doing his thing. Um, just a little bit, um, trying to think. I mean, I, I actually, all of the designers that I was kind of looking at were, you know, it was very European centric mm -hmm. still in the twenties. And um, I was kind of looking for like, well, who were the American designers then? And it was really the folks that were designing costumes for like MGM, mm -hmm. um, you know, Adrian in the 40s kind of came up and, and became like the Hollywood costume designer. But uh, most sources that I found online anyway said the first like major internationally known American designer was Halston in the 1970s. <laughs> like, um, it, it was like, whoa, really? We didn't have any? <laughs> um, so yeah, it was still very, very European centric and I think very Paris centric too. Yeah. Wow. And then um, what's up next for you guys? Um, Erica, Christine, what are you working on? Any upcoming exhibitions that we should know about? Not I'm, I'm between exhibitions right now. My Generation X exhibition just opened and um, we'll move to our suburban Chicago location in the fall. So, um, and beyond that, um, I did put a proposal in for a women's 20th century fashion. I had done one on 19th century fashion. So um, I hope that's approved. Um, it would be fun to revisit, you know, put these on exhibits and get them out on display, but yeah. But yeah. we're always um, happy to do these kinds of talks. This is so much fun for us to open boxes and pull things out and do show and tell. So, you know, we're we always should, here. We should definitely do a sequel to this, to this. Uh, Absolutely. You know? And um, I want to 
thank you. Thank you so much for um, Christine and Erica. Thank you so much for, um, for this presentation. I mean, just letting us in, knowing what a, a textile um, vault looks like, storage vault looks like is amazing. So, <laughs> so much. no, 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 it's great. So, um, so uh, I wanna just uh, add, if you're interested in the programs of the National Arts Club, you can visit us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. You can also visit us at nationalartsclub.org. I'm Katherine Kleszczewski. This is Erica Holtz and Christine. Thank you for joining us. Thanks so much. Thank you.